Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series, The Science of Reading is for Everyone. We're so excited that you're here choosing to spend some time with us learning about the science of reading. My name is Julia, and I am on the literacy team at Amplify. This is actually the final webinar in the series. Uh, so far, we've focused on bilingual learners, students with difficulties related to dyslexia, middle schoolers. And today I have Dr. Carolyn Strom here. We're actually gonna go all the way back to those critical early years. So we're expecting about uh, 3,000 participants today. Uh, we're gonna give everyone a moment to get situated, grab some coffee, grab a notepad, grab a friend, and we'll get started in about one minute. As you join, uh, feel free to let us know where you're joining from, what your role in education is. Uh, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. All right, we have Texas, Massachusetts, Utah, Virginia, West Coast is in the house. Croatia. Yeah. Wisconsin. Amazing, what a great group. That Lots of literacy incredible. coaches, preschool teachers, kindergarten teachers. Wow. So uh, just a few housekeeping items uh, before I kick it over to uh, Dr. Strom. Today's webinar is being recorded. We're gonna email out the recording for you to rewatch as you'd like, as well as share with your colleagues. Everyone who's in attendance will also receive a certificate in that email. We have a live captioner with us. So if you wanna access the captions, click on the live transcript in the bottom panel. Throughout the webinar, we're gonna be welcoming questions. Dr. Carolyn Strom is going to be pausing every 15 minutes or so. So feel free to throw some questions into the chat. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Carolyn Strom, uh, I'm excited to have you here with us. Uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Thank you all for joining. It was really exciting to see where you're all coming from um, in the chat. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to officially thank you um, not only for spending part of your day today here uh, during in this conversation, but also just for being in education, uh, especially at this time in the world. Um, it's been really stressful to be an educator the last couple of years, and I just wanted to thank all of you for your work, for committing so much to literacy, and also to those of you who are parents or grandparents working with young kids learning to read, thank you for, for all of your efforts. Um, I know it's, it's not easy and I just want to thank everyone for your time and patience here and also just in your, in your work um, at large. So I'm gonna start with some background really quickly. Um, I started off as a first and second grade teacher in Compton, California and East LA um, and absolutely loved teaching and fell in love with teaching reading. And I taught for about eight years, but what I found after eight years was that I had a lot of questions about what was going on in my students' brains. And even though I had been teaching reading for eight years, I didn't understand really the invisible processes that were going on in my students' brains. Um, and that's what led me to graduate school to really understand what is going on in a child's brain as they learn to read, as they do this miraculous thing that I was observing and a part of every day, I really wanted to understand more about what was going on inside the invisible processes. Uh, and now in my role at NYU, I'm a clinical professor where I really work on taking the science of reading, the brain research that we, we know about what goes on in kids' brains and connecting it to classroom practice. So a lot of my research really blends uh, research and practice because what is the point of research if we're not translating it and connecting it um, to practice. So before we dive into the content, just gonna start with the big picture. Um, I feel like any literacy conversations just start with this big picture. What is the problem? What is the problem in this field? And the big problem, as I'm sure you all know about, is that we only have 35% of kids proficient in reading in this country in fourth grade. In the healthiest and wealthiest country in the world, 
we somehow can only get 35% of our kids proficient in reading. Um, and that's just a, an example of inequity in this country that, that must be changed. Um, and it even gets worse for kids if you pull out um, kids who are eligible for the national school lunch program. So kids who are growing up in poverty or below poverty, well, then you only have a 21% chance of being proficient in reading. Um, and so I see this really as the problem that we're all here to fix. There's so many different ways to get at this problem. Um, in my work, I really look at how we can change kindergarten readiness and have kids enter elementary school better prepared for kindergarten so we can change these outcomes. But there's so many ways um, to get at this problem. Um, and while this is a problem, I, I wanna put forth that there's even a bigger problem. Um, and the bigger problem is that there is a lot of scientific research on reading. So it's not like we don't know how kids learn to read. There have been millions and millions of federal funds spent on research trying to understand how kids learn to read. It is like the most researched area of human learning, learning to read. But the issue, right, is that research does not change practice on its own research is not accessible or actionable on its own, right? And so one thing that just really gets me very excited and passionate is like, we know how to do this. So what's stopping us from making real change in these statistics? I really believe that it's figuring out how we can better uh, make research accessible and actionable. So that's the question that I work on and the ideas that I'm going to share with you today. So the overarching question um, is how can we share the scientific, scientific research more effectively? Um, so one, I'm going to go over how to start from the perspective of our children and their brains. So sometimes we start from what to teach. Um, and I really think we need to start from how children learn, right? And then that leads us into how and what to teach. Um, then I'm going to go over some visual metaphors on how to explain science with stories um, and an example of how I've been explaining the brain to preschool teachers and to families um, so that it's more accessible and then more actionable. Um, and then getting concrete. At the end, we'll talk about some classroom and kitchen table practices, because if we're really going to connect research and practice, then we always have to get concrete and not just stay um, theoretical. And so I've divided the talk into thirds. And after each third, I'll, I'll pause for questions and check out the chat. Um, right now, it looks great. So many people joining from all over. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, and uh, feel free to put questions in the chat and I'm not gonna just save all the questions till the end. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I'm just so happy that, that you all are here. So we're gonna start with the first big idea, which is that if we're really gonna connect research to practice, we have to start with uh, the, from the perspective of our children and their brains and what their brains are dealing with um, as they learn to read. So we're gonna ground ourselves in the mind of a child. I want you to try to read this passage and jump it in the chat if you can guess what it's from. If you've ever been an early years teacher or had a child at home, you've probably read this book, but it, right now it's in a code that you may not understand. And more than trying to figure it out, I want you to notice what your mind is doing as you're trying to figure this out and what is preventing you, this is a hint from the book that it's from, uh, what is preventing you from understanding this? Hadley King got it. Yes, and people are writing, they don't know the symbols. Yes, it is Very Hungry Caterpillar. It's Very Hungry Caterpillar and what uh, Evan says, he's looking for patterns, great. Yes, if you don't know the code, right? This says, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and popped. Now, if you don't know the code, you're not gonna be able to read this quickly. The translation is on the right. Now the words on the right are probably jumping off at you, right? You're, you know these automatically. This isn't a hard text. You can read this automatically. But what prevents you from reading the one on the left is that you don't know the code, right? And this is the fundamental idea, right? That in order to read, our kids need to understand the alphabetic principle, which means they need to learn to map graphic symbols to spoken speech units. In order to read, they need to take these, these graphic symbols and match them to speech units. And this is a very complex process, especially in English. And these can look like squiggles, lines, and dots. That's what a code can look like to a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old who's just beginning to read, or a struggling reader who has not learned to read. So I'm gonna show you this passage in another language. 
This is in Tamil, which is spoken in parts of India. And I just think it really illustrates how if you don't know a code, it can just look like squiggles, lines, and dots. Really want us to remember that what the kids are learning is not intuitive. This is a code that represents sound. Um, and we have to make it make sense for our kids. Which brings us to the big idea, one of the biggest ideas in the science of reading, which is that we aren't wired to understand a written code. We are wired for spoken language. So when we see a written code, right, we're not wired for it. We don't have an area of our brain that's wired for written code. We've only been reading and writing for around 5,000 years. Can anyone put in the chat if you know how long we've been speaking? I can't see the chat at the moment, but we're wired for spoken language and we've been speaking, we've been speaking for more than 50,000 years. So think about that, right? We've been speaking for more than 50,000 years and only reading and writing for around 5,000 years. We are wired for spoken language. That's why we have all over the world communities with rich spoken language, right? That don't, that don't know how to read or write, right? Because we're wired for spoken language. And if no one teaches us how to read or write, we're not gonna just pick it up. Uh, it's very, it's anal learning to read is analogous to learning to swim or learning an instrument, right? You wouldn't just play an instrument for a child and assume that they'll know how to play it or swim for a child and assume that they'll pick up swimming, right? You give them lessons because we're not wired to play an instrument. We're not wired for, for these things. We're not wired for reading um, in the same way that we're wired for spoken language. So when we come to the process of teaching reading for, for parents um, and, and for preschool educators, I always want to start with, we're not wired for this. We're doing something that's actually unnatural in our brains. So since we aren't wired for written language, we need to build a whole new system in our brains in order to read. And the cool thing about being in this field at this time is that we have so much neuroscience. We have tools like EEG, we have tools like fMRI. So we don't have to guess. We know exactly what is going on in a brain when it learns to read. So I'm gonna give a quick high level overview of sort of what is known from the neuroscience, just some of the big ideas that I think are important for practitioners, families, educators to know about, about the neuroscience before we dive into um, to some of the other content. So the first thing to know is that our students' brains come with visual regions for recognizing faces and objects, but not words. So this is a diagram, right? The yellow represents an area of our brain that responds to objects, and the red represents an area of our brain that responds to faces. And that's what we come wired for, to recognize objects and faces. Babies can recognize faces three or four months old, right? We're wired for this. And this is why we say skilled readers are made, not born, because we're not born with an area of our brain that responds to words right? We're born with spoken language. We're born with areas that respond to faces and objects, but not words. As a child learns to read, we develop a whole new area of our brain that responds to words. And this is called the letterbox. Some scientists call it the visual word form area, but it allows skilled readers to recognize words without much effort. All of you have it if you're able to read. You did not have it when you were born, but you created a letterbox in your brain. Um, and this area simply does not exist at birth or in non-readers, and it takes years to build. So I'm going to show you um, some scans from Dr. Stanislas de Haan's work, a French neuroscientist. And he did these scans and saw a notice, right? In this six-year-old non-reader, you see there's no green there. There's no letterbox. In a six-year-old reader, there is a green area, which symbolizes the letterbox. And that is what differentiates a reading brain from a non-reading brain, the letterbox, which is a very specific area of our brain. You can feel it, well, sort of feel it. If you take your left hand and you put it in the back left corner of your brain, um, back there, that's the left occipital lobe, that's where the letterbox is in your brain. Um, if, if you can read. Uh, so we see that a six-year-old reader has the letterbox, a six-year-old non-reader does not have the letterbox. In a nine-year-old dyslexic, we don't see the letterbox. In a nine-year-old reader, we do see the letterbox, right? So the big idea here is that a reading brain is very different than a non-reading brain, and we can actually see it in scans. We can see how the structure of the brain changes, mainly because if you can read, you have uh, this letterbox area uh, that we have to build. So we're going to be throwing around this word letterbox and throwing around the word word um, because that's what the letterbox responds to words. So I want us just to take a quick second and think about what is a word when we say our brain responds to words, what do we mean by by a word. She's just checking out the chat, see if anyone was 
sharing what a word is. So my question is, what is a word, right? And how is it processed in the brain? So a word is an interesting thing. A word has three forms. One, it has a pronunciation, bat. You can say bat, and that's just the spoken form, the pronunciation. Two, it has a meaning. When you say bat, there's also a correlation. If it's a, it's a word, then it also has a meaning, right? But if you're reading or writing a word, then the word also has a spelling. Right. So this is what we mean when we say a word has three different forms. A word has its spelling, its pronunciation and its meaning. And in order to read, these three need to fuse into one neural form. So that went a little ahead. So when when we learn to read, sorry, we're building on spoken language regions. So right now you see that sound and meaning, right, comprise the spoken language region of the brain. When we connect to reading, we are connecting to vision. So this is sort of a cartoon image of what's going on in the brain. We're born, this green um, bridge represents that we're born with connections between sound and meaning or the spoken language regions, but there's no connection um, to vision. Sorry, something's a little bit wrong with my slides. Okay, in order to read, we need to connect spoken language to vision. And we do that by developing two new neural pathways. And I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit, but the purple and the orange represent new neural pathways that connect the vision representation of the word to the spoken language regions. And this is what was sometimes called the neurological triple backflip. In order to learn to read, your brain has to connect these three different regions, which can be thought was just really amazing and hard to do. Um, and that's why I sometimes call it the neurological triple backflip of the brain. Um, this is a scan where you can see what's happening as you read a word, right? The word is processed initially in the back of the brain where we felt before, where you can see the word. But then what instantly happens with readers, right, is that the word explodes into the the spoken language regions, right? Because that's what um, this represents, this line and this circle and these circles and these little lines uh, that we see as bat, right? They're just visual, but when we can read, they explode into the spoken language regions. So we're gonna talk about how we build these neural pathways, because it's pretty amazing that we take a brain not wired to read and help and make it build these neural pathways. Um, but I'm gonna you know, talk about how the optimal period to do this is really ages three to eight. So that's when our, our brain plasticity is most optimal, right? And kids are most receptive, their brains are most plastic and can really create these circuits most easily. That's not to say that a kid can't read, it can't learn to read after age eight. I'm not saying that, it just takes a lot more work work and a lot more effort and a lot more time and a lot more intervention to get a child to start if you start to teach a child to read at age eight versus you, if you start at age three or four. Um, and so I'm really interested in, you know, what it takes to build these neural pathways super early so that our kids end up in kindergarten really ready for, for instruction at that point. So I mentioned at the beginning, the big question that I ask is, how do we share this scientific knowledge? We have so much scientific knowledge and so much of it is not accessible. It's not actionable for families and for educators. Um, and so how do we share it? And one of the sort of premises that I work off of is that storytelling enhances memory. We remember stories, we remember metaphors. It's very hard to remember brain scans or statistical data. Um, and so we remember stories. So we've created these visual metaphors metaphors about how the brain learns to read to make science more accessible and to explain science um, through, through story and visual metaphor. Um, so that's sort of the first part of the talk, just how we need to start from the perspective of our students and understand now what's going on in the brain. So I'll pause right here if there are any questions and I'll check out the chat. Um, yes, reading in the brain by Stanislas Dehan is like the Bible of this. Um, and language at the speed of sight as well. Reading in the brain really gets into all of these nuances. Great, just looking at, I love that everyone wrote um, some of the, their ideas of a word, great. So now we're gonna move on to um, the second part of the talk, which is, how do we share this knowledge, right? It's really not enough to throw up a couple brain scans um, and, and expect parents and, and educators to understand what's going on in the brain. Um, and yes, someone just wrote about phonographics. That's a great method, great method, phonographics, where they talk about letters as pictures of sounds. Exactly, exactly. So I'm going to dive now into the visual metaphors and how I've found, um, how I've found, how I've start began, begun to make some of the science uh, more accessible through visual metaphors and stories. 
So this is the cartoon model of the brain that, that I use. Um, and instead, you know, we say, listen, we have these, our brain, right? And our brain has different areas. One of the areas our brain has is the spoken language regions. And the spoken language regions have two different neighborhoods. So our brain is divided into all these different neighborhoods. One neighborhood is sound city, and that's where we process sound. And that's where we produce, per perceive and pronounce words. And then another area is meaning mountains. And that's where we create meaning right and store meaning so these two representations the pronunciation and the meaning are stored in sound city and meaning mountains which compose the spoken language regions and the big big idea is that the foundation of the reading system is in the spoken language region it all starts in the spoken language region because we're going to be connecting the visual region of our brain to the spoken language region right our our whole knowledge uh, that we're going to bring to text is from our spoken language system so this is really the foundation of the reading system um, and when children are really young, you know, birth through age three, we want to be building their spoken language because that's what's going to make them have such fertile ground over here to connect to um, areas of vision. So I want to point out how sound city and meaning mountains are very connected. So if you just change the a ah in bat to ah, change the a ah to ah, you end up with baat, which changes the meaning. Right, so you change one little thing in Sound City and you change something in Meaning Mountains. So the message we say to, and we use this model with kids too, right, is you make one little change in Sound City and that changes Meaning Mountains. Sound City and Meaning Mountains are connected because they're a part of spoken language. Same thing if you change the b in bat to k, you would end up with a cat, right? So one little sound changes meaning. Spoken language regions are, are intimately tied together. And this is the area that we're building that, that is the foundation of the reading system. We also explain that we have an area called vision villages, right? So we stay away from the scientific jargon. The scientific term for this is the uh, occipital lobe. Uh, um, and we just don't call it that. We call it vision villages because we don't really believe that families and educators have time to necessarily um, decipher all the scientific jargon. So we call this vision villages. And vision villages, um, as we said before, has areas responsible for recognizing objects and, and areas responsible for recognizing faces. But we don't have an area responsible for recognizing words. So when we see a line and a circle and a circle and a line and another line and a little line, our brain doesn't know what to do with it. It's not a face, it's not an object. It doesn't know what to do with it. It may as well be Greek. Right? There are no connections between vision villages and the spoken language regions. So how are we going to get this, this, these, just this squiggles, right? How are we going to get these squiggles over to spoken language? Um, and we're going to talk about how we do that. But first, we want to marvel at, oh my gosh, we don't have these connections, right? We're actually asking kids to do something that's very, very difficult. They don't have a part of their brain responsible for recognizing words. And since this is not a face and this is not an object, we need to build these connections somehow to spoken language. So the big question is, how do we connect these areas, right? So that we create one neural form when we read. And as we go through the slides, you're gonna see this little air traffic control tower. Um, and that represents executive function and working memory. So I'm not gonna to get too into those ideas here. That would be a, a separate talk, but I just wanna remind ourselves that with any learning, executive functioning and working memory is a big part of the process. So you'll see the air traffic controller there, which reminds us that what's ultimately governing sound city, meaning mountains, vision, villages, and all of learning is executive function and working memory. And if there's a lot of anxiety, if there's a lot of trauma, if there's a lot of feeling unsafe, if there's a lot of stress outside the brain, right? Um, outside the body going on in, in a child's environment, that is gonna stress the executive function and working memory, which is gonna stress all learning. Um, um, and going to overwhelm the process. So I just, that's why, that's what the air traffic controller is. Um, and so as we're talking about building the connections, I just want us to always remember that executive functioning is, is moderating, modulating the whole, the whole process. So in order to learn to read, we have to, the sounds and spoken words need to map to the letters and written words. So we talked about how spoken language region, it, the spoken language region is the foundation, right? And here we have vision villages and vision villages does not know how to respond to something that looks like this, right? So the very first thing we need to do with very young children is develop sound sensitivity, sometimes called phonemic awareness, which is the ability just to perceive sounds in your native language, to perceive sounds and words 
and then play with those little tiny speech sounds and words. And this is a huge predictor for learning to read is kids who can develop a very fine grain appreciation of sounds or sound sensitivity um, really tend to read earlier and, and be stronger readers. So the very first thing we need to do is develop sound sensitivity and segmentation, right? What is segmentation? Segmentation is taking a word like bat and separating it into b -a being able to hear the first sound. So that's why in a pre-K kindergarten classroom, you might do alliteration or think of words that start with b, b or think of words that have a, a. What we're doing is we're fine tuning uh, Sound City, right? Sound City needs to become fine tuned to really be sensitive to these individual sounds. And then at the same time, what we need to do is retrain those neurons in vision villages that are usually used to recognize objects and faces. We have to train them to identify specific letters. So we have to train those to get very, you know, uh, visually tuned to what this is, right? And how it's different from other, from other letters. And then the most amazing thing has to happen. We have to create a mapping between vision villages and sound city. So this illustration here is, the, is what we try to convey to kids and, and families and educators is these are vision neurons and these are auditory neurons and they're communicating with each other. They're creating this mapping. They're saying, oh, this line and this circle means a b. This line and this, this circle and this line mean an a. And this line and this line mean a t. And that is a mapping. That is a mapping we're not wired for, but it is a mapping that we need to create in order to read. Because the only way that we're going to get this visual representation to connect over to Meaning Mountains uh, is through Sound City. Because what do these letters represent? They represent sounds. So that's why they have to go through Sound City. There's no way that you can just memorize words. Learning to read is not a visual memorization process. Uh, it's a process that where we go from letters, from where we have to convert letters into sounds. And so we build these strong mappings between individual letters and speech sounds. And the mapping is the key. So we face a challenge in, in English, especially um, with when learning to read, and it's called mirror invariance. So right here, you see an example of mirror invariance. This is a chair facing to the right, a chair facing to the left, a chair upside down, and a chair upside down the other way. Any way that you put this chair, it's still going to be a chair, right? You're not going to call it by another name because it's flipped a different way. But that and that principle in our vision system is called mirror invariance. And we have the same thing for faces. A face turned left or right is still gonna be a face. Um, but we have to unlearn mirror invariance when we learn to read because a B flips the other way is a D or a D and a D flips the other way is a P and a P flip the other way is a Q, right? So mirror invariance actually has to be unlearned in order to read and mirror invariance is a property of our vision system that we come with. Again, that we have to unlearn in order to read. And that's why we see kids do reversals, right? And when they're just learning to read, um, they'll do reversals. So this says Lego, but reverse them. They mirror wrote the L, read, but they mirror wrote the R. This child mirror wrote her whole, her whole name, Angela, perfectly. She wrote it perfectly, um, but she wrote it in the mirror image, right? And this is because what kids are doing is they're applying this principle of mirror invariance. Um, and we actually have to unlearn mirror invariance in order to learn to read. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a child is dyslexic if they're doing reversals. That's a myth that was out there for a long time. Um, what it means is that a child is in the process of unlearning mirror invariance and uh, over coming this aspect of, of their vision system. So that's just, I put that up there to, to remind us that that is a challenge um, in learning to map, right? We're using a part of our brain um, that is usually used to identify faces and objects um, and that contains mirror invariance and we need to unlearn that in order to make this mapping from vision villages to sound city in order to ultimately get to meaning mountains, which we'll talk about now. So once we've made this mapping, right? We haven't read yet. We've just made a mapping. Now the words must be blended together and mapped to meaning. So we say, okay, once we go from vision villages, right? To sound city. So we convert this visual input into a sound. I'm just gonna make it more easy for, easier for Meaning Mountains to understand. Now, what do we have to do? We have to build our capacity to blend these sounds together. Okay, a process called blending. Um, so now it's not just b -a -t, it's bat, 
We blend them together into one speech form. And now we can send it over to meaning mountains, right? And that's where we have to find the word in our spoken language. What is bat? Is it this sporting equipment or is it um, the animal, right? So that's, that's what we, you have in meaning mountains. And this is what we mean when we say we're building the phonological root, right? We're building the phonological root. Um, to th from vision villages through sound city to meaning mountains. So for those of you who know the scientific terms, right, you're going through the phonological processor, right? But instead of calling it that with kids and with families, we call it sound city. It's the area of our brain that we need to build up. It's the neighborhood in our brain that we need to build up to be really refined, to uh, perceive sounds and produce sounds and play with sounds. But this is what we mean by the phonological root. There's again, like I said before, there's no way that you can learn to read a word without identifying its sounds. That's what letters represent. They represent sounds. So they have to go through Sound City in order to get to Meaning Mountains. So the very first letter strings that we begin to learn are what are known as CVC words, right? Consonant, vowel, consonant. This is the most common syllable in the English language. Um, and usually at this stage of reading, when you're just beginning to blend, these are the first kind of words that, that you learn and you learn to process on your phonological root. I also don't want to ignore the role of writing. So when you're building the phonological root, we know that writing the sounds is important as well. And they're really, um, they're reciprocal processes, reading and writing, and the relationship is bi-directional. So when you're reading, you're going from vision villages to sound city to meaning mountains. But when you're writing, you're taking an idea or a word from meaning mountains, converting it to sound, and then converting it over to vision villages. So that's building the phonological uh, root as well. So I want to share with you what it sounds like when a child is building their phonological root. It can be a very tedious process. Um, I'm just going to play a little clip for you. Um, here's the transcript. And also don't put the eraser on the word. Put it under so you can see the word. Tag challenges there. Um, you guys get the idea. It's very slow, right? You can literally hear her struggling through from going from vision villages to sound city to mountains of meaning. Um, and now with early writing, because we know that early writing builds the phonological root, this is what early writing would sound like. So this child wanted to um, write, I watched Power Rangers. Uh, and so he ends up writing these consonants. But listen, think about how, how fast it would take you to write, I watched Power Rangers, probably five seconds. But look at the cognitive work that he's doing here. So that child is building their phonological root, right? Taking these, these ideas, breaking them down into sounds, and then translating them into letters. And this is just, I just want to get as concrete as possible to say that what kids are doing here is just miraculous, right? They're building this phonological root that doesn't otherwise exist. They're building these connections between, between letters and sounds. And I just want to highlight, um, sorry, trying to get to the next slide. Um, I just want to highlight some research on handwriting here and how important it is. So there's a great study from 2012 um, that analyzed the effects of handwriting on brain development in pre-literate children. Um, and what they found, what they did was they placed non-readers in three letter teaching conditions to learn some letters. So there was the handwriting condition, the typing condition, and then the tracing condition. And then non-readers were shown images of the letters while they underwent fMRI scanning to see which group uh, if any, activated the reading system, right, after they learned in these three ways. And what they found was that the reading circuit, what you see here, right, the reading circuit was activated only in the handwriting condition. So 
the conclusion, right, is that practice writing letters makes it easier for the brain to recognize letter shapes. And learning to write actually enhances our visual processing of letters. And I say this because when we talk about learning to read, often writing kind of doesn't get as much attention. And when you're learning to read, writing is a huge facilitator um, of, of, of learning to read and really helps us build this phonological root. So the bottom line in this research was that writing is more effective than tracing and typing. And the conclusion for the classroom is that writing needs a prominent place in early literacy instruction. Yes, as early as three years old, kids can learn how to form the letters, right? And how to make the sounds that the letters represent. So just wanted to take a moment there to just highlight how important that is. So back to our brain model, right? Now we have this phonological root. We have these connections between the vision area, the sound area, and the meaning area. And what happens is we grow our abilities to identify and map now groups of letters to sounds and link to meaning. So instead of a word like bat, we now can read a word like bath with that digraph that TH says. We can begin to read words like nest right, that go beyond just CVC, but go into CVCC, two consonants after a vowel. But still, when we're reading words like this, we're reading them in the phonological root. We're sending these, these, these vision forms over to Sound City that's also sending them over then to, to Meaning Mountains. And we begin to read words like spoon that have a vowel digraph in there, ooh, right? So at this stage, after kids have mastered CVC words and just three letter words, we move into four letter words and words that have these digraphs, just to give us a, an idea of what's going on in the reading system. It's not like you learn to read CVC words and then you're automatically a fluent reader. You begin to build up into larger units. And again, we have growing abilities to segment words into sounds for writing. So I'm gonna show a slide about how reading and writing develop in parallel, always to be thinking about how, how reading um, and writing are in parallel. And what begins to happen, you see that the letterbox lookout just appeared. So what we say is that there's now this specialized area of vision villages um, that is specialized for these words. So uh, once a brain has begun to see a word, some, for some kids it's four times, for some kids it's 40 times, this area called the letterbox begins to specialize for that letter string and it activates spoken language. Some people, this is similar to what some scientists have called orthographic mapping, right? It's when the brain has now stored, um, stored this image um, and the sight of the word activates the sound and the meaning. And now the word is going on a faster neural pathway called the lexical root. Um, it's going much faster because it's going on a sort of like a muscle memory. Your brain has developed muscle memory for the word, which is, which is the letterbox, which as we talked about at the beginning is the thing that separates readers from non-readers, the, the letterbox. So after, again, this is all happening, I'm going quickly, but it's all happening over many, many years, right? We now have this robust system with two neural pathways, the phonological root and the lexical root, taking us from vision villages um, over to spoken language, right? And now at this stage, what we're really working on is multisyllabic words and increasing automaticity. So hoping that this eventually is gonna take up less effort um, and increasing automaticity with kids. So we're working on multisyllabic words, words like remember and words like interesting, right? And now we're not reading them sound by sound. We're typically reading them syllable by syllable. Um, and that's really what's going on. And now I'm talking about kids are ready for this around age six, age seven, certainly age eight. Um, we would hope that kids are reading multi, beginning to read multisyllabic words. And letterbox lookout gets bigger and stronger, right? We're knowing more words from memory. The lexical root gets uh, thicker and, and stronger as well. And over time, lo after lots and lots of practice, right? We know that practice is the key here to build this circuit. Uh, thousands of familiar words are read in less than half a second via the lexical root. So that's, you're processing words at quarter of a second, millisecond timing, right? Um, and that's what's happening as, as our brains sort of evolve and develop this, this, this reading network. So as a quick overview of some of the imagery and story that, that we use um, with families and educators and kids to tell the story of the reading brain. Um, these are the four central images, right? We start with spoken language, we build a phonological root, then the phonological root can, can tackle harder words and words with more letters. Um, and then we begin to build our letterbox and uh, the lexical root. And over time, we're, we're processing multisyllabic words with automaticity. 
And so we developed these brain, these mini maps um, to just talk about the, the pathways. So this is again, just spoken language. We developed the neural pathway that's the phonological route, then the lexical route. And by the end of sort of once you are a proficient reader, you have both routes functioning um, simultaneously. So I just want to highlight how all of this happens um, in parallel with spelling. So these are Erie's phases of reading, which maybe some of you are familiar with. I'll go over them quickly, but show, I'm showing how they map to the brain and also to, to spelling. So usually the first phase of reading, right, when kids just have spoken language and no connections to the vision areas of our brain, they might be writing random letters, but they have no concept that the letters represent sounds, right? So they see letters almost just as graphic symbols. And this stage, they might begin to read a sign like Starbucks or Netflix, right? But they're not really reading, um, they're reading the logo. They're remembering the color and they're remembering the shape, but they're not actually reading. Um, so we call this phase of reading pre-alphabetic because kids are not using alphabetic symbols and representing them to sounds. So they might see a word like look and remember that the O's uh, remind them of eyes. In the partial alphabetic phase, kids might be able to write something like this. Can anyone um, figure out what this says? It says, I like my bear, right? So, oh, good, got it, thank you. <laughs> See people writing, I like my bear. At this stage, kids are reading and writing really based on just the initial and final sounds. So a word like look, they might pronounce as lock or like or luck. A word like bat, they might pronounce as bet or butt or bit. Um, and this is what we call the partial alphabetic phase when kids are just using initial and final sounds. And they're just beginning to build that phonological root. Over time, as their phonological root can handle harder words, more complex words, they begin to write in more conventional writing, right? So this is, I love tacos. My favorite food is tacos. It has lots of tastes like lettuce, tomato, and cheese. This child has really understood that letters represent sounds and can hear almost all the sounds in the words, right? Which is contrasted with phase two. At this phase, kids will also start to read all the sounds in words, as well as digraphs like ch and chest and oh, oh, uh, and look and O, A, O, and boat, right? They're beginning to be able to map all of the letters they see to sounds. And that's what's going on in the full alphabetic phase. And by phase four is the consolidated phase when kids again are reading and writing with multisyllabic words. So I just wanted to anchor that. I know many of you are probably familiar with Erie's phases um, and I know we talked about the brain. So I just wanted to map the different neural pathways onto those different phases um, and to spelling to give an idea of what this looks like over time. And again, this can happen from ages three to eight. So it's a big span of time. So that's the end of the second part. I'll pause here and see if there are specific questions on, on sort of that story. Again, it was a quick overview, but I hope it gives an idea of how we can begin to share the science in accessible ways that make it more actionable for educators and families. Um, and now I'm gonna get into the concrete part. So what does this actually mean for tomorrow at the kitchen table with your child or in your pre-K and kindergarten classroom? Um, but I'll pause here for um, some questions. Oh, Melody asked if I can go back to the last slide, sure. Glad that these are, um, you feel the metaphors and visuals are, um, are accessible. Um, I see a lot of things. I'm glad someone was talking about handwriting and visual processing recently. So it's so essential. Um, I see there's a question about using whiteboards over paper. There's actually no research on that, um, whether whiteboards over paper or paper over whiteboards, but that would be an interesting um, study. Um, okay, Beverly, I hope I answered your question is how, how this mirrors Erie's phases. Here, here it is. Um, Okay, I'm gonna get to the concrete stuff and then um, and then um, and then I see one other question. 
there's a question about um, when teaching writing, should we start with a certain type of paper? You know, the jury's out on that, um, but it, it is there. It is always helpful to have some paper that helps kids remember where, what lines to go to. So some people use different like visuals for that to remember the different lines, um, but there hasn't, I haven't, I'm not aware of research that has compared um, teaching kids to write with certain lines versus other lines or no lines. And Kelly asks, should I have my preschoolers writing the letters and not tracing? If you can, teaching them to form the letters and to remember the movement of the letters is really, really, really beneficial. If you're going to have them trace, then at least have them say the movements that they're making, right? So round, 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 and up if you're making a k. Right. So just really having them remember how to make the movement rather than just having them blindly trace. Um, so the third piece here, if we're going to really share the scientific knowledge base more effectively, is to not just stay in the brain. We always need to start in the brain and really understand this amazing process, this, this process that we train our brains to do, which is create a whole new circuit, or as I showed you in, in the brain model, a whole new civilization composed of all these different cities, right? We create this whole new thing in our brains, um, but we can't just stay in the brain. We have to get concrete and get to the classroom and to kitchen table practices. So that's what I'm gonna spend the last bit of time here doing and then save some time at the end for questions. And I'm gonna share some tips for sounds and focus teaching strategies. So I've mentioned throughout this talk that reading is not as much a visual process as it's a sound-based process. We have to take the visual input and go through Sound City. Sound City is the router for the whole system. Um, and so we really need to pay attention to sounds in the early childhood classroom and, and at the kitchen table with our kids. So my, I'm gonna give five recommendations. My first recommendation is to play I hear, not only I spy. So you guys are probably familiar with I spy. I spy with my little eye, something that begins with the letter C, right? And that could be a cookie or crayons, or it could be a chair, chair begins with C, or it could be cereal, cereal begins with C, right? Well, something that is, can be more effective is playing I hear. So I hear with my little ear, something that begins with right? So that could be a cookie, it could be crayons, it could be kite, it could be Christmas tree. The spelling doesn't matter. What we want kids to focus on is the sound, right? Because we're trying to build Sound City. So playing I hear with my little ear, not just I spy with my little eye. So we can practice it right now. If you want to play I hear with my little ear and look around, something that begins with and if you're looking around and you can't find something that begins with then you can just think of something. That's the beauty of I hear. You can say, I hear it in my mind. I hear with my little ear. Oh, a lot of people do floor, good. Flowers, oh, I'm glad someone can see flowers. So finger, phone, fan, or I saw floor, flowers, feet, perfect, right? And again, it doesn't have to be something you can see because you can tell the kids, oh, I hear, what am I thinking of? I hear with my little ear, something that begins with, so you're getting kids to tune into sounds rather than just letters, right? And we know that that helps build the phonological root. The second recommendation is to feature books that play with sounds. So we obviously read a lot to our kids um, in school and at home, but we want to feature books that play with sounds and then give opportunities for kids to talk about that. So one of the series that I love is um, Miss Millie, Mrs. Millie is Silly. So here's an example of talking about this book. So this in this book, uh, the, the, it says, every day she says, good morning, children, please hang up your goats. Don't be silly, Mrs. Millie, you mean our coats. And the teacher says, what's funny about Mrs. Millie saying, hang up your goats? And LaShawn says, because we don't have goats at school, we got coats, right? So they're playing with the g and the k, which this book is excellent at doing. And the teacher says, good, let's think about the difference. Goats has what sound at the beginning and the kids say g. The teacher says, what about coats? What's the sound at the beginning? And the class says, k. And then Jaden raises his hand. Teacher says, yes, Jaden. And Jaden says, I think C and K are friends. And the teacher says, what do you mean? And Jaden says, because they both make the k sound. So by providing opportunities to talk about this book, they end up talking about sounds, again, building Sound City. Here's another example from the Mrs. Millie series. She asks the kids if they want hot apple spider, but obviously she really means hot apple cider. So thinking about what's the difference between spider and cider? Why would Mrs. Millie have, have confused that? Spider and cider. Oh, there's a p, p in spider, but not in cider, 
right? So again, using books to, to, as an entryway into sounds. Um, Teresa asks, is a series of books, I think there's about four or five Mrs. Millie books. Another book that plays with sound is Did You Take the Bee from My Ook or Did You Take the Boof from My Ook? And it's a, a book that's, that kind of speaks to the kids directly and says, hello, do you have favorite things? I have favorite things. They're bats and beaches and bread and bulldozers and bushes. Um, and then uh, what happens is he sneezes and he loses the book. So for the rest of the book, he's trying to tell you what he loves. He says, I love my Ed. It's the est Ed in the whole world. And kids really get into this because he's leaving off a sound. It's not the est Ed, it's the best bed, right? So again, you're using books to tune into sounds. So third recommendation is to play with sounds and words, which, which the last two activities do, but these activities do a little more explicitly. So the first game I'm gonna talk about is called fiddle with the first. So you're fiddling with the first sound. So you have mop and you have nap and you have sack and you tell the kids, we're gonna change the first sound to t. So what does a mop become if you changed m mm to t? A mop becomes a t t top and a nap becomes a t t tap and a sack becomes a t -t tack, right? So fiddle with the first. You can use, I use pictures, especially if you're working with English language learners. Here's a um, game called fiddle with the middle. So a little harder, but I found that some pre-K and kindergarten kids are ready for this. So the word is mop, but now we're gonna fiddle with the middle. So the ah becomes ah. So a mop becomes a map. And what does a clip become? Clip becomes cl app and sock becomes ack. So a lot of times we play, with, we play with these games, right? And we don't incorporate the picture. And sometimes that really leaves out our dual language learners, right? For who, for a lot of them, these words are new and we wanna help them connect these concepts to, to um, meaning mountains, right? We always wanna remember that reading is vision villages plus sound city plus meaning mountains. So incorporating um, images is, is I found to be very helpful during these kinds of games. Along with recommendation three to play with sounds and words um, is use tongue twisters. So in the classrooms I work with, we do tongue twister Tuesdays. So if you guys wanna start with this one, try to say it three times out loud as fast as you can. How many snacks could a snack stacker stack of a snack stacker snack sta snacked on stacked snacks? Tongue twisters are always fun and, and help us realize how, how tricky sounds are to say. So this one, if you wanna try to say it two to three times, how many cookies could a cook cook if a cookie cookie cooked only cookies? And then you've probably heard this one, Benita bought butter, but the butter was bitter. So Benita bought butter to make the bitter butter better. So these are all under recommendation three, which is play with sounds and words. Um, another activity that I'm sure a lot of you are doing is sound swap. So you take a common song or a common rhyme, like row, row, row your boat. Um, and then you take the initial sound and you replace them with a different phoneme like b. So row, row, row your boat becomes bow, bow, bow your boat. Bentley bound the beam. Barely, 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 barely. Bife is but a beam. So if we would change it to with a z sound, we would have zo, zo, zo your zote, right? And anyone who spends time with three, four, five-year-olds, six-year-olds knows that they really enjoy playing with sounds and words like this. It's fun. There's something very human and very um, humorous about playing with sounds and words. Um, and the last example I'll give is doing a rhyme swap. So you can play with sounds and words by doing a rhyme swap. So taking a common rhyme like hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock, the clock struck strong, the mouse ran down hickory dickory dock and changing it to hickory dickory doodle. And then with the kids coming up, what could rhyme with that? Hickory dickory doodle, the mouse ran into a poodle. The clock struck strong, the mouse ran down hickory dickory doodle or hickory dickory dupe. What could be a rhyme with hickory dickory dupe? The mouse ran in a loop the or up a stoop. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down hickory dickory dupe or hickory dickory dumbo, the mouse ran through some gumbo. So these are just examples um, of, of, again, ways to play with sounds and words using what kids already know. Uh, recommendation four, um, is just to routinely play segmenting and blending games. So in the classrooms I work with, we call it turtle talk and cheetah chat. Turtle talk is slowing words down and cheetah chat is speeding words up. So I'm gonna say words like a turtle here and you guys are gonna say words like a cheetah. Um, so the first word is j, e, t, and then you do cheetah chat. If you said that really fast, it was a jet, 
I said it slow like a turtle, and then you guys say it like cheetahs, cheetah chat. The next one is v, e, t, cheetahs, vet. So this is how you play it with the kids. The next one, sh, e, o. Now cheetah chat, shell. Next one, sh, e, p, sheep. Right, and the last one, Ooh, I said it like a turtle, you say it like a cheetah, slip. So you end up with these five words um, that you guys said in cheetah chat and I said in turtle talk, which is just playing with segmenting and blending. And then often if there's time, we talk about the differences between these words so or, or similarities. So jet and vet rhyme, but what do shell and sheep have in common? They both start with shh. What do sheep and slip have in common? They both end with so again, really stressing sounds um, and building up sound city. You can also just play turtle talk on its own, have kids say the word like gas, and then um, say how many sounds the turtle would say if he said gas, which is three, gas, bus, three, key, how many sounds would turtle say, two, and bench, four. So the last recommendation, and then we have some time um, at the end, my last recommendation is to share scientific terms like brain plasticity in engaging ways. So I showed you some of the examples of the storytelling stuff that I've been doing with families and kids and um, educators, but we also use rhymes, right? So instead of just saying brain plasticity is important and our kids' brains are plastic, right? We made up a chant that goes, my brain is plastic, so fantastic just like elastic, changes can be drastic. The more I learn, the more my brain changes and rearranges, right? And so kids who are super young can sing this and families enjoy it too. And it makes brain plasticity a little simpler. Um, we've translated it into Spanish and French and Mandarin, because um, those are the, the languages of most of the classrooms that I work with. Um, but just again, making the brain really fun and accessible, because I, I wish that I had known what was going on in the brain when I was a teacher, because it's, again, the title of this talk is Cortex in the Classroom. And that is what is in, that is what is facilitating the learning, right? Everything that's going on in the cortex. So um, we went through these three points. I know I went a little quick and I'm sorry about that, um, but now I wanted to have some time for closing and conversation. So I just will go over the big three points. Um, you know, we started talking about how we're not wired for reading, right? We're creating a whole new circuit in our brain in order to read. Um, and in order to really ground us all in what's going on in the brain, we need to get away from a scientific jargon and we have to tell the story of the reading brain in an accessible way that makes sense to families, educators, and kids. Um, and then the third piece was just going over how important it is to build sound city or the phonological processing areas of the brain um, in the very uh, early years. Um, so if you uh, want to stay in touch, there's my email. Um, and then if you want to sign up for a newsletter, that's where I send out some of these resources and images um, is through the, through the newsletter that you can just sign up there. Um, so I don't know if anyone used the q and A. I actually don't know how to get to that. Oh, there's a Q&A, yes, okay. So Amy asks, is there anything we can do to help guide students through unlearning mirror invariance? One method I would, I would recommend is called embedded picture mnemonics, and you can email me for that, but it really embeds a picture onto a letter, which helps kids see the letters more like a familiar object and less like um, a letter, which is a total abstraction. Um, Sarah asked, should letter names and sounds be a focus in pre-K? Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a bit of a debate, you know, whether you teach sounds first or letters first, um, but certainly pre-K kids are ready for letters and sounds and they love playing with sounds. Um, Evan said this goes beyond the early literacy topic, but students who read beautifully but spell way off. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more structured work with orthographic mapping, tying, yes, tying to meaning with homophones. Um, I'm so glad. Thanks for the feedback. Sorry, I'm just reading through the chat now. 
I look forward to hearing from some of you if you want um, some of these materials. So the, the big question, what about advice for working with dyslexic kids? So what I explained to families of dyslexic kids is that a big challenge with dyslexic kids is building the phonological root. So making the connections between vision villages and sound city is particularly difficult um, for dyslexic kids. So you just have to teach these uh, connections more explicitly through structured literacy interventions. And I'm happy to answer that over email um, as well. So Julia, I can hand it back over to you. Yeah, Carolyn, thank you so much. This was an incredible presentation. I am watching all of the praise coming in in the chat. And I'd also like to thank everyone who made the time to join us today, whether it's your first webinar with Amplify or one of many, we really appreciate you and we are so happy to have you here. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about whether there's gonna be a recording sent out. Yes, we're going to be sending the recording uh, within the next 48 hours. And Carolyn, there's a lot of questions about the images that you shared and the slides. Uh, anything that you'd like to include, we'll be sure to include that in the follow-up. So just let us know uh, what you'd like to include. We're also going to be sharing the chat transcript. I know a lot of people shared some really great resources, reading buddies from the Reading League was mentioned. So a lot of great things out there. We're gonna make sure that you get all of the follow-up resources within the next 48 hours. That sounds great. And I saw there was a question about, is there a book? I'm in the middle of working on putting all of these materials together for a book. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and again, you'll get information on that if you sign up for my newsletter. All right. Uh, with that, we hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Uh, feel free to follow Amplify for more events and resources, as well as Carolyn's newsletter, where you can get more of these images and resources. We appreciate you, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.